Good morning, I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily update for December 15th, 2022. Today I'm going to take a deeper look into the implications of the release of the Twitter files. Uh, there was a flurry of information and news on this, and then it's sort of been dampened down by the arguments coming from the mainstream media that this is not a news story, there's nothing new about it, and more importantly, they're saying this is not a First Amendment issue because Twitter is a private company, and therefore this has nothing to do with government efforts to control the narrative or to mislead the American people. Now, when you look at this, you, you from the what's in the files so far, what we see is that there was definitely censorship, there was definitely political manipulation, and the question is, on whose behalf is this is this being done? And I'm going to take a quick look at the Hunter Biden case. But what's necessary is to realize that there has been an effort, especially from the Obama administration, to incorporate Silicon Valley and social media into the control of the narrative. That is, it's not just the mainstream media, the television, and so on, because younger people are getting more and more of their news from social media. So the effort to engage private sector operatives in Silicon Valley to work on behalf of government talking points. And by government, I mean the talking points that defend the issues raised by the uh, military industrial complex, the neoconservative war hawks, and the neoliberal economic controllers. So we'll look at the implications of this relationship, especially in uh, refuting the line coming from mainstream media that this is not a First Amendment issue. It's not an issue of government suppressing anything, that it's a private company, and therefore it's, it's not an oppression against freedom of speech. And in fact, if you say that, it's dismissed as a conspiracy theory. So looking at some of the work that's been published by Matt Taibbi so far, what have we learned? One of the things we learned is the direct relationship between U.S. intelligence agencies and Twitter and social media in general to develop the targets for censorship. Now, the Obama administration had several meetings, had top intelligence officials go out to Silicon Valley uh, to coordinate actions in promoting the government's hybrid warfare policy. There were representatives of the Defense Department and State Department that met with tech execs in January 2016. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security and the State Department funded a consortium called the Election Integrity Partnership to coordinate censorship on social media platforms. This involved bringing in private organizations to work with this government uh, agency this consortium, which was funded by U.S. government. Uh, among those involved were the Stanford Internet Observatory. Stanford is a key outpost of the private sector involvement in, in cyber operations. And secondly, the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab, which the Atlantic Council is a central think tank involved in promoting Anglo-American intelligence uh, lines, that is the, the coordinating the hybrid warfare on behalf of the war hawks from the British American intelligence community. Now, while Twitter denied engaging in censorship, this has been proven by these documents released by Musk through Taibbi and others, that, that this was a lie. When Dorsey testified, the head of Twitter testified before the Congress, he was lying. And this directly relates to the October 2020 story of the Hunter Biden laptop when the New York Post reported on it and stated that this showed real involvement of the Biden candidacy, Joe Biden and his son Hunter, as operatives of Ukrainian intelligence. Uh, this was rejected as a story by the Twitter Moderation Council. And it not only suppressed the story, but uh, kicked New York Post off the Twitter line for a period of time. They locked it up. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. When Musk 
release the files. Initially, Twitter provided these files to the, their general counsel to determine which could be released, to weed them out, to redact if necessary. And who is that general counsel? James Baker, the former general counsel for the FBI during the whole Russiagate case. Baker has been implicated in the lies that were produced by the FBI that were used in the FISA court against Trump to argue that there was Russian interference in the election. Now, it's suspected that he was purging Twitter files to remove any evidence of FBI involvement in the targeting. At the same time, a top Twitter operative involved in the uh, so-called moderation, uh, Yoel Roth, admitted that he was working closely with government agencies, including the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, the Director of National Intelligence, and so on. So when you look at this, then come back to the Hunter Biden case, look what we've learned. Now, what happened when the, the case was released, where the New York Post reported that there was evidence that Hunter Biden had been involved with his father in shaping a narrative around what was going on in Ukraine uh, and was being paid for it by Burisma, a company owned by Ukrainian oligarchs. Now, immediately, former intelligence agencies were called in to uh, do the dirty work of, of the cover-up. And more than 50 former intelligence agents signed a letter that was released on October 20th, 2020, just two weeks before the election, saying that the Hunter Biden laptop issue has all the classic earmarks of Russian intelligence, Russian disinformation. They write, our experience makes us deeply suspicious that the Russian government played a significant role in this case. Now, they didn't just put out a letter on this. This letter was covered by uh, press and media that did not cover the contents that were released on the hunt from the Hunter Biden laptop. Uh, for example, Politico uh, said that the that reported that the intelligence former intelligence operatives said that the what's coming out in the New York Post quote mirrors a narrative that U.S. intelligence agencies have described as part of an active Russian disinformation effort aimed at denigrating Biden's candidacy. Again, two weeks before the election, this was released. The letter was signed by former Director of National Intelligence James Clapper, former CIA Director John Brennan, both of whom were heavily involved in the lies that were, went into the whole Russiagate scandal. Uh, former DNI Michael Hayden, former CIA Director Leon Panetta, former Acting Director of the CIA Michael Morell, and, and a number of others. And what they wrote as sort of a, a, uh, an excuse for the letter, they, they write, we don't know if the emails are genuine, and we do not have evidence of Russia's involvement, but we are suspicious of Russia's involvement, and that's what the media covered. Now, why is this so important? Well, we're living under the post 9-11 national security state. The use of the terror threat from 9-11 then morphed into the, after 2016, the end of the global war on terror and the need to, to combat the peer nuclear allies of Russia and China. In other words, the threat shifted from uh, the war on terror to the threat coming from Russia and China. And therefore, the, this had to be addressed. And, and that's the whole rationale for Russiagate, the combination of British intelligence and U.S. intelligence officers who did everything possible to make sure that there would not be a friendly relationship between the United States and Russia. And Brennan and Clapper, two of the initiators of this letter, on the Hunter Biden case, were coordinators of the Obama administration intelligence operations against the Trump campaign in 2016, and then leading the role, once they left their agencies, 
in continuing to slander anyone in the Trump circle who was talking about friendly relations with Russia. Now, these are the same networks which today are involved in the war, the proxy war against Russia that's being conducted by NATO. They're the ones who denied that Russia has any legitimate security concerns about expansion of NATO eastward. They deny that there was ever an agreement made by the United States and, and NATO to not move eastward. They say that never happened. They're putting out the hostile narratives against Putin and Russia, which are used to justify the $100 billion so far that's been voted up or uh, committed for emergency military aid to Ukraine. Uh, they also have been covering up the eight years of killings of Ukrainian citizens in the Donbass by the Ukrainian army and neo-Nazi militia. They cover up the fact that there are neo-Nazis in the Ukrainian defense and security forces. They were probably involved in the blowing up of the Nord Stream pipelines, or at least the cover-up of who did it, and, and so on. What are they attempting to do? Their goal is to destroy Russia and China as possible actors in developing an alternative financial system to the speculative system that's collapsing worldwide today that we see in terms of inflation, we see it in terms of the likelihood of debt defaults, bank collapses, and so on. But they're trying to manipulate the population to say it's all Putin, it's all Russia. Your gas prices are up, it's Putin. Price of eggs is up, it's Putin. Your dog's pregnant and your garbage cans are turned over. It's Putin. This is the role of the networks and intelligence, including active duty intelligence, coordinating with former intelligence operators like Brennan and Clapper to try to manipulate U.S. public opinion so that the American people will not be concerned that we're heading toward a possible nuclear war with Russia over defending corrupt banks and a speculative system that's pr protected by lying intelligence officials. Now, why is this so important? Well, there's a poll that just came out that said that less than 1% of the American population uh, is worried about Russia as the top problem facing the US, less than 1%. So all the work they're doing hasn't amounted to much yet. And yet the narratives are still there. And that's why it's so crucial that our voice is heard and our voice is being heard. Now, we're going to have a discussion on Saturday, which will include some leading people like Colonel Richard Black, uh, the one of the co-founders of the VIPs, the Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, Ray McGovern. It will include Helga Zeppler-Rouche. It will include former New York Senate candidate Diane Sayre, and I'll be participating. This will be Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and I'm going to link the meeting, the announcement of the meeting on the description page of today's update. Help us build this conference. You're, if you're angry about Twitter, if you're angry about censorship, if you're angry about lies and propaganda, don't just sit there stewing about it. Join us in exposing it and fighting for an alternative. So this will be this Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, uh, and the link, as I said, will be in the description page. Uh, tomorrow is Friday. Hopefully, I'll be taking some questions. If you have your questions, send them to me at harleysch at gmail.com. I've already gotten a couple that are quite interesting, and so I'm looking forward to hearing from more of you.